Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we continue in our studies with the minor prophets and many things that are being pointed out to us for this time in earth's history, shall we seek the guidance of our Heavenly Father and ask his blessing as we open his word today so that we may more clearly understand our responsibility and that which we need to do at this time. Shall we now seek him in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, as we come before you on this Sabbath morning, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided. We ask also, Father, for forgiveness of our sins. Help us now, Father. Guide us as we open your word and that of your prophets, that we may more clearly understand that which we are to do at this time in earth's history. Father, as we seek you, as we open your word, we ask that your angels attend us, each one. We ask, Father, as well, for your spirit, so that our minds may be clear. Direct us now. Help us as we discuss these items from your word, as we compare scripture upon scripture as we compare line upon line. May your will be done in our lives. May your guidance be clear. May our minds understand that which you are presenting before us. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, this morning, I have been led for us to open the book of Hosea, and we're going to we're going to look at Hosea chapter eight. As the translators would have presented. Hosea chapter 8 gives reference to destruction that is threatened to both Israel and Judah for their impiety and their idolatry. And this is very, very blunt and very direct, more for our time than for the time in which this was written. Now, the first verse Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Now, the alternate reading here says to set the, the trumpet to the roof of thy mouth. How can a trumpet be blown if it is set to the roof of thy mouth. I don't actually think that's a good translation. Okay, then what? how would you see it? Um, the idea here is that this is the palate. Now, I understand that that's what they, they're, they're trying to translate that in sort of a literal sense. But the really the idea here is in, is the sense of taste, right? So 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 there's this is about a message, right? So you right. take the message, you eat it, but you also give that message. 
right? Because this this comes from the word kanak, which means uh, um, to actually train up to properly to narrow. So initiate, initiate or discipline, uh, dedicate, train up. Okay. Now, as the translators had looked at this, when they're saying to set this, we come back to Hosea 5.8. Blow ye the coronet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at beth -Avon. After thee, O Benjamin. We have in this verse, earlier in Hosea, that the instruction is being given to blow the coronet, blow the trumpet, and then cry aloud. Why is it important for us to understand that these messages are given in three different ways? Coronet, you have three. I'm sorry. Ahead. Please. You have three. You have three there too. Also, it says the cornet, the trumpet, and then cry. Right. Aloud. So we there would be the third angel's message. Three angel messages. Good point. How else do we see this? <clears throat> Now, I'm looking at this, and I find it very interesting. <clears throat> if we take this in the reverse, what is the meaning of beth Aven? Where we see Beth, we see the house of. So this is the house of something. What is it the house of? It's a house of vanity. Okay. Is it also the house of idols? Mm -hmm. Because the word vanity there, Avon, uh, refers to idols. Okay. Are we at this time to be vain? Are we to be holding on to idols in any way, in any manner? Yet, do we see that idols are being held on to all the way around us? So, what of Rama, where we're to blow the trumpet? Is Rama not a high place? How should we approach this? Okay, so, so Rama means a hill. Okay. And what of Gibeah? That's also a hill. So it's a little hill. Okay. Now, within this movement, at this time, have we not experienced the fact that we've had to climb a hill and then come down from that hill? We've had high points, we've had low points, and yet we still come to a point where idols are being held on to. <laughs> so, 
excuse me. Now, we're to give a message of warning, are we not? Are we not understanding. an understanding? But yet, where is this message to first be given? House of God. And where do we find it? Do we have yet two witnesses as to that we are to give this message beginning at the house of God? Do we have two books of the Bible where we can point to this? I remember destruction starts at the house of God. Um, and there's one more. I can't remember exactly what it is. Okay. So if we were to look at Ezekiel, ver Ezekiel chapter 9, does this not say in Ezekiel 9 verses 5 and 6, that the message is to go first to the ancients at the house of God? Chapter and verse again. Nine, five, and six. Well, it's talking about um, uh, slaying. So beginning at the sanctuary, beginning with the ancient man before the house um, upon whom uh, they do not have the mark right so the mark is this mark from the, uh, the writer's inkhorn so God's people are marked that would be the seal of God the ones that don't have the seal of God are to be slain now if we were to compare this with 1 Peter 4 17 what would that tell us Well, judgment must begin at the house of God. On the strength of these two witnesses, does this message then begin to the leadership and then go forward from there? It seems well, what it applies. Okay, now it's also being given reference that Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6 should be included. Yeah, that's saying, um, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Or in, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. Now, as we would continue with this, set the trumpet to thy mouth. Prepare to give the message. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. And the definition here, the verse that is being used to identify the he that shall come, takes us back to Deuteronomy 28. Now, who was giving the warning in Deuteronomy 28? Well, that's Moses. Okay. But who gave this warning to Moses? Well, God. And Moses said to the children of Israel, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And Jeremiah 4.13, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Habakkuk tells us that their horses also are swifter than the leopards. 
and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. But yet, to complete this, Hosea tells us that they shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and have transgressed my law. Who is it that have transgressed the covenant of the Lord? Who's being referred to here? God's household. Yes. And Hosea 6, 7 tells us, but they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Do any of us seek to deal treacherously against God? I would say we don't seek to, but, but, <laughs> right. We have been studying two very necessary points for us to understand. And they both begin with the third letter of the English alphabet. We have been studying covenant and character. Covenant and character are to be the hallmarks of the message and of our faith. Because if we are not willing to keep to the covenant that God has out, outlined for us, then do we have the character of Christ? I, I would venture to say no. Okay. Now we're going to return here. With his own finger, God wrote his commandments on two tables of stone. How important was it for the children of Israel to have received these two tables of stone? Salvational. Has it not been established that those two tables of stone are the transcript of the character of God himself? Yes. Okay. By the way, I like the reference for the C. Right. Third letter of the alphabet. That was, that was a good observation. Well, that's our Heavenly Father's doing. Comment from the chat says the references to chariots and horses gives reference to Sisera's iron chariots and military might in Judges 4, similar to Rome using others' military might to enforce its edicts. <clears throat> These tables were not left in the keeping of men, but were placed in the ark. And in the great day when every case is decided, these tables inscribed with the commandments will be placed so that all the world will see and understand. Do we have today a similar teaching aid as Moses had with those two tables of stone. Yes. 
we have two tables ourselves, the charts. Correct. The witness against them, the witness against the two tables of stone will be unanswerable. And upon those who have taken upon them the work of shepherds of the flock will be visited the heaviest judgments because they have presented to the people fables instead of truth. Children will rise up and curse their parents. Now, we face difficult situations right now. Many of us will have children that will turn against us. And it is indeed a hard thing. It's difficult to accept. The solace that we must take in this is we are to love God more than our parents, more than our children, more than our friends. We do not know how many will come to salvation. The best we can do in accepting the covenant with God is to participate in the reformation, the reformation of our character. Now, in the chat, a reference is made to Isaiah 10, verse 12. Why is this important? Uh, it um, in my um, it uh, has to do with the um, judgment begins at the house of God. Okay. You want me to read it, please? Wherefore well, it shall come to pass that when the Lord has performed His whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruits of the the uh, heart of the Asians and the glory of his high looks. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Are we to give a message based upon our own ideas and premises what kind of a message are we to present so I, I would suggest that what you asked is the very reason we get in trouble because um, we put our own spin on things well, that's not what we're supposed to be doing Agreed. We're supposed to be studying what God tells us and then translating that to others. In this situation, do we have any safety in teaching traditions of men rather than teaching the commandments of God? Wasn't that one of Jesus' complaints? Yes. But so then there... I would have to say no. Okay. Rather to serve God than rather than man. Amen. Now another comment that has been made gives us reference to Matthew nineteen twenty nine. Why is this important? Because you spoke about children turning against you for Christ's sake. It's happened in my life. Sure, it's happened in yours and probably others too. It says, everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold 
and shall inherit everlasting life. This verse is like these that help keep me encouraged and help me stay on the straight path. All of us need this kind of encouragement. All of us are seeing the effects of the fact that our adversary, as a roaring lion, is walking about to see whom he may devour. Thank you for these references. This next paragraph is one that is very difficult to read. Yet it is for us. Church members who have seen the light and been convicted, but who have trusted the salvation of their souls to the minister, will learn in the day of God that no other soul can pay the ransom for their transgression. <clears throat> As I have learned over many years, the safest admonition that I can offer to anyone is do not take my word for this. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Do not accept what I am saying. Check this out for yourself. But Dwight, I don't have time. Uh, what do you think? I've used this example many times. In answering your question, brother, a friend of mine was brought before his church to be examined by the elders to be disfellowshipped. I was allowed to observe this. I was a witness to what was going on. One of the elders, a man that to this day I yet greatly respect, was making a comment because there were many things that were being addressed. The biggest thing of which had to do with these two charts behind me. When the elders were being asked, are we not to study? For ourselves, this elder replied, I don't have the time to study. The leaders of the conference have the time to study, and I will rely upon their word. They will tell me what to believe. But what do we see here? The opposite. Exactly. Many times those within the church and some within the movement become very complacent. They have seen the light. They understand that there is a message to be given and that this message is important. And they're convicted that this is the right message for this time, but they are trusting their salvation to another man, or in some cases at this point, to another woman. They will learn in the day of God that no other soul can pay the ransom for their transgression. If an angel was not a fitting sacrifice for man, how can man be a fitting sacrifice for man? Christ alone was sufficient. The Son of God alone could pay the ransom for my transgression. Well, well because he made his he made the sacrifice, I don't have to I don't have to do anything now. He's already done it. That's what I keep hearing. That, yes. That's validating their sins or validating okay. my sins as well. 
Yet, what what was the word of Christ? If you love me, you will keep the commandments. Okay. A terrible cry will be raised. I am lost, eternally lost. In another segment of the Spirit of Prophecy, the vision is given that there will be those that will have the same words upon themselves, upon their garments, as were presented by the bloodless hand during the Feast of Belshazzar. Mini, mini, tekel, eupharsin. weighed in the balance and found wanting. A terrible cry will be raised. I am lost, eternally lost. Men will feel as though they could rend in pieces, as though they could tear apart the ministers who have preached falsehoods and condemned the truth. The pure truth for this time requires a reformation in the life, but they separate themselves from the love of the truth. And it can be said, and of them it can be said, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Can there be a more fearful pronouncement that you have destroyed yourself. The Lord sends a message to the people, set a trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Now, I found it interesting, because the verse actually reads, set the trumpet Yet here, it is quoted as set a trumpet to thy mouth. Why would that be? Your question again, please. Okay. If we, if we look here, in the verse itself, it says, set the trumpet to the, to thy mouth, right? Yeah. yeah. Yet here, it is being quoted, set a trumpet to thy mouth. Now, my question is, why would the quote be given changing a word? Uh, meant for our time. Okay. <clears throat> so here we have that we are to set a specific trumpet. This trumpet is to call for a meeting or it is to give a message of warning. In what context here would we apply this trumpet are we calling people to meet together or are we using the trumpet to give warning warning well it, it actually kind of depends are, are we talking about right now present because we're trying to get the upper room experience going on Amen. It is for both. We need this message so that we may gather together, right? Yes, sir. Yet we need to be prepared that this message will help us to give the message of warning. Yes, sir. We are in the world, 
where because of their sin, our first parents lost the beautiful Eden that God had given them. Did man create Eden? No, sir. Eden. He was set in for my uh, mind dressing and the care of uh, the inner portions of it, you know, the, the animals and that stuff. It has now been 5,000 years since the passing of Adam, roughly. Yet we are told that when Eden is restored, Adam will yet recognize the very vines, the very plants that he so carefully tended. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and were given permission to eat of every tree in the garden but one. But they ate of the forbidden fruit and their sin opened the floodgates of woe upon our world. Now, again, as a witness, I have heard a pastor in a sermon state directly that Adam and Eve really didn't do anything wrong. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> denial is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> there you go. It is. <laughs> <clears throat> so. It's almost blasphemy, ain't Amen. Yes, sir. When you turn away from the word of God and you insert your own opinions, you are telling the fables that will result not only in the destruction of the fable teller, but on those that choose to accept the fable. You know, the, during the great controversy, the, I read the whole grounds controversy and all of it's important to me. But you know, the one that hit me most, most strikingly was when it said the two atoms met. Yes. And with you could see the reunion between the two atoms. Yes. That was the most, um, I would say the most, to me, that was the most beautiful scene that any human being can witness. I would agree. And if we play our cards right, we'll get to see it. Yeah. If our characters are reformed and we are willing to accept the covenant, not just pieces of it, but all of the covenant, we will then see this transpire. From that time, sin grew worse till God destroyed the world by a flood, saving only Noah and his sons. Since that time, sin has been steadily increasing. Men have not learned that God means what he says. As it says in the book of Genesis, Male and female, he created them. Men have not learned that God means what he says. Men are making the choice that men can be women and women can be men. Men are making the choice that the 
admonitions found in Scripture can be easily set aside. Sodom was destroyed by bolts of fire from heaven. God threatened to destroy Nineveh. The inhabitants repented, and their destruction was averted. But they turned once more to their idolatry. Their sins reached to heaven, and their destruction came. The world is fast becoming as it was before the flood. Now, how many years ago was this particular article written? Eighteen ninety eight, by the looks of it. Right. And is that not 125 years ago? Today, it looks like. I'm sorry, March 25th. Yeah, because this, this was written May 26th of 1898. Right. Satan has set up his throne on the earth, and the law of God is trampled underfoot. God made the world in six days. And rested on the seventh, sanctifying it as the day of rest. He gave it to man as a memorial of his creation, saying, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Adam's sin is repeated. The Sabbath of the Lord is discarded and scorned, while a spurious Sabbath, the child of the papacy, is accepted by the Protestant world and is cherished and exalted as supreme. But it has not a vestige of sacredness more than any common work day. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and have, trans pre have trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Is the law of God to be a strange thing to us today? It's not supposed to be. But as this is written, how true is this today? Laws enacted by finite authority are exalted above the law of Jehovah. Men trample underfoot God's holy law and say of God's people, as the Jews said of Christ, we have a law and by our law, he ought to die. Now, we should, we should observe this from John 19, 7. We have been observing and looking at many verses that show a symbol recently. And what are what is the symbol of those verses? Is the symbol not 187? 187? The symbol of July 18th, right? Oh, I'm sorry. John 19, 7 is 187? Yes. 
Now, the point that I'm trying to make, we've had a warning that has been being given, and we tied that warning to 187. 187 2020 July 18th of 2020 right yes 197 if we were to look at this would be 197 in a symbolic manner the day after the warning is given Yet, in this part of Scripture, what is being said of Christ by the Jews, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. Those that give this final message, will they not be treated just as Christ was treated? Oh, yeah. We are on the verge, brothers and sisters, where a message is to be given and those that give this message will be treated much like the Savior was treated. Over and over again, this will be repeated. This is not my words. You may find this and you, as we are reading this, Signs of the Times May 26th of 1898. Christ has told us that in the world we shall have tribulation, but that in him we shall have peace. Those who live during the last days of this earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God, because they know that arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. They, the judges, will say, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law with them is supreme. Those who respect <clears throat> this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow to the idle Sabbath will have no favors shown to them. Now, a point is made from the chat that there was a huge Nashville celebration in 1897. <clears throat> Excuse me. All that is brought against the validity of the fourth commandment is of human invention. There is not one word in the Bible to sustain the first day of the week. It is a spurious Sabbath baptized by human enactment, and given to the world to be kept holy. But, false though it is, the world cherishes it, thus pursuing a blasphemous course. The sins of the inhabitants of the cities and towns have reached to heaven, and it is time for men to pray in humility before God. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and is of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return, and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering, and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, 
let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And of course, we would find this in Joel 2, verses 12 to 17. Here we, be, we are being shown and given the admonition of the position that we are to be taking today. This is to be done before the great day of the Lord. This is to be done before the admonitions that we find in Ezekiel 9. For do we not have to have a character prepared to give such a message? Do we not need to have a forehead of flint so that the accusations that come against us may be addressed and that we may be prepared to give an answer for our faith? Okay, now that's an that is an interesting point. In that was uh, that was in our studies last night. Okay. So in the Review and Herald of the twenty first of February, on the first page, there is a statement to the effect that those who stand in the council of God will have wisdom to detect Satan's movements and to avoid them. Now, do you remember exactly which review and herald this statement was found? I'm looking. Uh, no, it, it, all it had was the um, that quote. There's nothing above or below it that would indicate which one. Okay. Thank you. I would suggest that it's possibly the date when, which are, you know, the year at least um, that this testimony was being given. Could be, could very well be. Strictly because he did not put a date in it. Okay. Hosea 8, verse 2, Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel, holding on to their idols, choosing to follow after the nations around them, shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. When the Savior pointed out to his followers the sign of his return, he foretold the state of backsliding that would exist just prior to his second advent. There would be, as in the days of Noah, the activity and stir of worldly business and pleasure-seeking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, and giving in marriage, with forgetfulness of God, and the future life. For those living at this time, Christ's admonition is, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, 
and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 34, and 36. The condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's words in the Revelation. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Revelation 3, 1 and 3. And to those who refuse to arouse from their careless security, the solemn warning is addressed. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Here we find this in the Great Controversy, 1888 edition. These are not the warnings to Laodicea. This is a warning to the church at this time, even though the church now is Laodicea. If we choose not to watch because our pastor says, everything is fine, you don't have to worry then are we not accepting that Christ will then come as a thief upon us? If we will not watch, are we not abandoning our position as a watchman on the wall? Are we then deciding that our intelligence is greater than that of God's? It was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the close of probation. The prophet of God declares, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Joel 2.11. Who shall stand when he appeareth, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look upon iniquity? Habakkuk. 1, 13. To them that cry, My God, we know thee, yet have transgressed his covenant, and hastened after another God. Hosea 8, verses 2 and 1. Psalm 16, 4. Hiding iniquity in their hearts, and loving the paths of unrighteousness. To these the day of the Lord is darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. Amos 5.20 It shall come to pass at that time, saith the Lord, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and shall punish the men that are settled on their leaves, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1.12 I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah 13, 11. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. Zephaniah 1, 18. 13. <clears throat> now, in these various passages, are we not being given line upon line to understand exactly the position that we are currently in at this time in Earth's history? I'm sorry, uh, question again? In these passages that we have just read, are we not being given an admonition so that we may understand where we are today in this earth's history? I would, I would think so. 
Now, a question is being raised in the chat. It's asking how many days there are from May 1st to October 31st in 1897. Can someone do that calculation quickly, please? Well, it's a period of five months. It's probably 153 days. But... Okay, so we have a period of five months. That May, May 1st, what? Go ahead. May 1st, what? May 1st, 1897 to October 31st in 1897. Doesn't really matter the year. Okay. Going to be the same in every the prophet jeremiah looking forward to this fearful time exclaimed i am pained at my very heart i cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard O my soul the sound of the trumpet the alarm of war Destruction upon destruction is cried. Jeremiah 4, 19 and 20. Here in Hosea 8, 3. So uh, that answer is 184 days or six months, including the date. Yeah, six months. So we have 184 days or six months, inclusive. Interesting. Inclusive, correct. Well, I had 186. Okay. If you had to do it 30 days, 30 days in each month, six months, that's 186, ain't it? 5-1, 1897 to 10-31, 1897. Okay. Right? Okay. I don't know if this calculator is correct, but it says 184. And it is the one I've been using. Yeah, it's 184. Good deal. Okay. Sorry for the distraction, Dwight. No, it's not a distraction. We the questions are welcome. Right. Now, Hosea 8 3. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. Is it a good thing? Is it a righteous thing for us to cast off that which is good? No. If I heard you right, no. And what happens when you cast off that which is good? Well, you just jumped off the path. It becomes evil, don't it? Well, the enemy shall pursue them. Right? Is that not what this scripture says? Yes. We need to be very certain of the positions that we take and the only way that we can be sure of the positions that we take is to study for ourselves. Dig is we're searching for lost treasure. Yes. With the severest reproofs, 
God sought to arouse the impenitent nation to a realization of its imminent danger of utter destruction. Through Hosea and Amos, he sent the ten tribes message after message, urging full and complete repentance and threatening disaster as the result of continued transgression. Ye have plowed wickedness, declared Hosea. Ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst turn in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Therefore shall a tumult ar arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Hosea 10, 13. To 15. <clears throat> of Ephraim the prophet testified, strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. The prophet Hosea often referred to Ephraim, a leader in apostasy among the tribes of Israel, as a symbol of of the apostate nation. Israel has cast off the thing that is good, broken in judgment, unable to discern the disastrous outcome of their evil course. The 10 tribes were soon to be wanderers among the nations. Hosea 7 verses 9, 8, 3, 5, 11, and 9, 17. Some of the leaders in Israel felt keenly their loss of prestige and wished that this might be regained. But instead of turning away from those practices which brought weakness to the kingdom, they continued in iniquity, flattering themselves that when the occasion arose, they would attain to the political power they desired by allying themselves with the heathen. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian. Ephraim is also like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. They do make a covenant with the Assyrians. All of these are warnings from the book of Hosea. Through the man of God that had appeared before the altar at Bethel, through Elijah and Elisha, through Amos and Hosea, the Lord has repeatedly set before the ten tribes the evils of disobedience. But notwithstanding reproof and entreaty, Israel had sunk lower and still lower in apostasy. Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer, the Lord declared. My people are bent to backsliding from me. Hosea 4, 16 and Hosea 11, 7. Now, how many prophets, how many men of God does it list here as being sent to the ten tribes. Four. You have the man of God that appeared before the, the altar in Bethel. You have Elijah. Five. You have Elisha. Exactly. Five. Five are being sent to the ten. Repeatedly, God is setting before them the evils of disobedience. Was the nation of Israel at that time accepting the covenant with God? Evidently not. 
as we as we talked in one study. Here, this man of God appears before the altar at Bethel. And was that not before Jeroboam? And yes, what did, it was. And what did the what did Jeroboam, the king of Israel, do at this time? When he heard the the warning message before the altar at Bethel, he tried to harm the prophet, and his arm was withered. Now, in this situation, we have. Jeroboam setting up an altar at Bethel. And where else did he set up an altar? Did he not set up? Thank you. Thank you, Aram. They set up the altar in Dan. Dan meaning judge. Bethel, house of God. This man of God was sent to give a message. He was given specific instructions. Did he follow the specific instructions that God gave him. Very directly, the man um, of God. I found that article. What? I found the article. Yes. It is the February. Uh, date it is the date in the year that uh, that I had mentioned and the name of the article is Awake Out of Sleep and it's by E.G. White okay and I never found the actual wording but if you look at what he says um, in that he doesn't actually say that she said that but it was it looks to me to be a paraphrase okay of the, of the subject and after I've read it yet yeah, that's what it seems like that is, uh, that's volume 70, number eight, February 21st, 1893. You're interested. Okay. I'm sorry to disturb you, but. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. This article, I think, should be read by all of us. Yes. Going back to the question, the man of God that appeared before the, the altar at Bethel did not follow God's direct, specific instructions. This man of God is a warning for us today. This man of God was told that he was to return to his home by a way different than he came to give this message. He was not to stop. He was not to eat. He was not to drink. He was to leave Israel. He didn't do it because another one identified himself as being a prophet of the Lord and entreated him to stop, to eat, and to drink with him. We are not to ignore any of the word of God, even in the smallest sense. 
even if they've said that they've been sent by God. Exactly. Elijah and Elisha, Amos and Hosea, repeatedly set before them the evils of disobedience. This is now set before us. We cannot afford to deviate from the word of God in the smallest of manners. There were times when the judgments of heaven fell very heavily on the rebellious people. I hewed them by the prophets, God declared. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They, their have they dealt treacherously against me? Hosea 6, 5 to 7. So that, that, that guy violated the same thing, um, basically or essentially, as Eve did and then Adam. Yes. What is the... What, what was the first test that was placed before the Savior after his baptism? Wasn't it, wasn't it food? Um, he went into the wilderness straight away, and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights by Satan, if I'm not mistaken. And the first one was uh, with appetite. Right. The disobedient prophet, the man of God that gave the warning at Bethel. What was he tempted with? Appetite. Food and drink, right? Correct. Can this be applied to the first angel's message? Well, um, <laughs> that was the first sin. So, yeah, I'm I could, I could buy into that. Okay. Are we not told to fear God, to give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come? So if this is the first angel's message, was this man of God then benefited by the warning that was given with the second angel? Noting that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. As you do this, um, it becomes quite apparent where the separation points are um, in the story uh, before the flood, the first angel's message, we just talked about it. Second right. angel's message would be, um, I'm thinking Cain and Abel. And then the third angel's message would be Noah's. Okay. I mean, it's, it seems as though. Right. I think I'm getting better at understanding how this thing works. Before, I would have never saw that. Okay. Now, from the chat, the comment is made that it reflects to me in the times when we shall not be exhibited to buy any food or sell unless we have the mark of the beast. Here we have our situation. We have a line in Revelation 14 that tells us, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come.
when Christ was tempted after 40 days in the wilderness, he'd had no food, no water. He met the adversary on the same ground that Adam and Eve had failed. How did the Savior respond to the adversary when he is told to turn these stones into bread, if you are the Son of God? For we live on, uh, well, we live on the bread that God gives us. Well, he quotes Deuteronomy. Yes. Right. So he fasted for 40 days, representing the 40 years in the wilderness. Yes. Uh, in Deuteronomy. Um, I'm trying to find the verse. Uh, if we went to Matthew 4, what would we find? It's Deuteronomy 8.3. Yeah, Deuteronomy, okay, yeah, I knew it was one of those chapters there. So um, it says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So he's he's quoting the text that deals with the 40 years and the 40 days, of course after 40 days fasting. What was the first test that was given to Daniel and his friends? Appetite. Well, you know, eat this stuff. No, we won't. Now again from the chat, man lives not by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. Which, Amen. okay, as we're looking and as we're considering this, if we are choosing to eat of the word, or as Christ presented, to eat my flesh and drink my blood, are we not drawing closer to Christ? Yes. Are we then not benefited by the message that tells us to fear God? That we are to accept that God is able to sustain us even when man will not sell us food, water, or other sustenance. I refer back to um, A.T. Jones's statement that I put in the chat. Okay. When Elijah gave the warning message to Ahab that there will not be dew nor rain in Israel except by my word, saith the Lord, And he left. How then was Elijah fed? The crows brought him food. So is God capable of doing exactly what he says he will do? Absolutely. Proven over and over again. When... Daniel and his friends refused the meat and drink from the king's table. And they asked only for, as they say in scripture, pulse. What was the outcome that was observed? Uh, fairer and healthier. Here again. Did Daniel and his friends show that they feared God? That they took God at his word? Yes. 
is this not to be our position for this time in earth's history well if these things were written for our um understanding of the things that god wants then i would say yes If we tie this to the first angel's message, that we are to fear God, and that we are to overcome in appetite, just as Daniel and his friends, just as Christ had done, are we then not also to give glory to God? Amen. And when we give glory to God, when we accept that he is able to do exactly what he says he will do, are we then not showing his character before the world? Again, I would have to say yes. Okay. Now we are coming close to our time, the close of our time here to get today. Do we have any other thoughts, questions, or comments at this point? Yeah, I know where I messed up on my ad mess. Um, I forgot to bring down to zero on that 30 and 6. So that's my okay. fault. Things happen. We appreciate the, you know, the offering that you brought forward for our consideration. And that's part of what these studies are all about. Really? I mean, that's it's it's the gang that that uh that helps. I mean, it's having all the sources that are with us that helps us to understand these things. The, the whole point is that, as scripture says, iron sharpens iron. Amen. We are here, each one, to improve our understanding of the scriptures so that we may be more prepared to give this message before brothers and sisters that have not chosen to study as William Miller did. Yes, I would agree that we are to pray for each other. Right now, we are coming to a point to accept that we have the need of the upper room experience. We have the need of accepting the righteousness of Christ. We cannot have true righteousness in and of ourselves. It is only by Christ's righteousness that we can stand before the mercy seat. That we can go to judgment. And that we may be found not guilty. The invitation is being given. How are we going to choose to respond? Shall we now close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we ask today for your forgiveness. For we have sinned we need to learn more of how we are to draw closer together. 
how we are to be prepared so that we may truly honor you in all things that we say and do. Be with us now. Go with us. Direct us. Show us that that you would have us to do so that your character may be honored. May your will be done in our lives so that we may stand with you and not against you. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to draw closer to you, to walk with you, and be guided by you so that the Spirit may have an abode within our hearts. For this we ask, for this we thank you, and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.